Okay, so uh, just handed back your homework, I mean, your, some of your lingering homework uh, quizzes and your test one. Uh, you guys performed very well on the exam. You had a 91.5 average, which is uh, right in line with uh, my expectations from previous semesters, so very well done. Um, additionally, there was a 45 out of 50 average on the VHDL assignments. Uh, I've uploaded annotated PDFs. The, the assignment you gave me, I uploaded the PDF to your group page on Blackboard. So you can go through and see where I marked points. Uh, common uh, mistakes I noticed were after you got through the code that I had given you, they go and, and, or, nor, and then you started getting to the two to one muxes and XORs, you guys were forgetting to check for what happens if you have undefined inputs. So you would have, I, you know, I'd run it and go, what's, if I have undefined and undefined, it would put out a one on the output for an and gate, which is not proper operation. So uh, lost point there if you didn't test it properly. Uh, I'm trying to remember other, um, if you just didn't submit a test bench at all for certain files, that's where people lost some points. Um, also, there are uh, two groups that just submitted only a cover page of the PDF. You have to submit a full report, uh, so make sure you do that. Um, and so I've changed the dates of the due dates to account for a number of things. So your second VHDL assignment was supposed to be due this coming Sunday. I've bumped it back to next Sunday. Um, additionally, I've stretched out the due dates between each one. Um, I've cut some problems out. Um, I did not realize, I, I uh, over-anticipated the amount of coding background that you, know, you guys had. So um, to adapt for that, I've reduced the complexity of the assignments. Um, focusing more on building coding fundamentals. And uh, so instead of building a 32-bit data path, we're going to do the same thing, but only with an 8-bit data path. It'll be less code, um, but you'll still be able to claim the same thing on your resume that I have in the syllabus. Um, so that, that's how I'm adapting based on the feedback I got uh, from uh, your submissions. Um, so I have a policy, and I'll tell a quick story about uh, what happens when students get back their exams. Get back exams, see something you don't like that I've graded, and you're mad. Grr, professor bad, I hate him, right? Um, I always insist that students wait 24 hours before asking for any regrade. The reason why is precisely that. You have to read, relax, look at the answer key, take a day, sleep on it, and then decide if you're still mad tomorrow. If I've graded it wrong today, Guess what? It's not going to magically correct itself overnight. It'll still be graded wrong tomorrow, right? The reason why I have this policy in place is because I had a student once. I handed back the final exams. He did not like something I marked. It was consistent with how I marked it for the rest of the class, so I didn't give him the points back. And it made no difference in his final score. Still would have gotten an A in the course regardless. The student got so mad that I actually found out where I lived and was Mr. Morrison, open up. We need to talk about my exam. And that was, I drove home after class. So I, I, I had to actually call the police to have them tell them to leave me alone. So as a result of that incident, I now have a policy that you have to wait 24 hours <laughs> before asking me for any regrades. And also, don't be the person who goes, I know you said 24 hours, but no, no, no. Don't do it. I'll tell you no. I'll, I will say, go away. So it's just it's for your benefit. It's for my benefit. For, it's also a good way to it's a good way to live life. Take take a deep breath before you get too angry. Um, but for most of you, I don't see uh, reasons why you would be angry. You guys did very well in the exam, so you should be commended for your hard work. Um, okay, so I hit all the uh, bullet points that I wanted to hit. Um, okay, so I wanted to go over this really quick. Uh, how do we implement two-bit comparators? So to give you an example, I originally had a 32-bit comparator as part of this problem. It's been reduced to eight. Now, additionally, same thing with the uh, full adder. I had a 32-bit full adder I wanted to implement. Only do an eight-bit full adder. So that's reducing complexity, reducing time. So how do you take a uh, um, two-bit comparator, which we designed last lecture, right? <coughs> We designed this two-bit comparator. We designed, yeah, A1 and A0, B1 and B0. So the reason why we're going to cascade them, because if you don't, 
you have to go through this whole design process for a 3-bit comparator, 4-bit comparator, 8-bit comparator. And sure, you can do this and reduce the overhead, but if you want to reduce the amount of time that you're spending on code, there's a better way to do it. So the better way to do it is to do this cascading approach. And what's going on here is you have the first two bits, and you would set these bits to be zero, right? And the whole point is, if you have the previous bits, it's going to go from the least significant bit to the most significant bit, right? And so if you have this truth table here, if A1 and B1, if A1 is 1 and B1 is 0, I don't care about these, right? And the reason why is because I've already demonstrated the most significant bit is 1. Therefore, F3, which I have labeled as A greater than B in this case, it's automatically true. Here, if the most significant bit is 0 and the least significant bit is 1, again, I don't care. F1, which I have labeled as B greater than A. Here, if A0 and if A1 and B1 are 0, or these are the same, right? So now we have to go to what happens if we are comparing here. So again, if they're the same, if A1 equals B1, which in that case, as cascading, means F2 is equal to 1, then what we're going to happen is you're going to cascade these values over here, and then this comparison is going to dictate which one's greater. So here, what happens if they're all equal? So these are the cases, both are 0, both are 1, so 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1. So this is all the cases where both of the most significant bits are equal. What ends up happening is you take the carry from the other bit in. So think of it, analogy, oh yeah, that's right, all the chalk is kind of hiding over here. Uh, for some reason, Gollum's hiding all the chalk in the corner. So I kind of described uh, comparing uh, comparators uh, when I was in the uh, lab upstairs to a couple of people. Think of it kind of like a basketball tournament. There's multiple ways you can do it. You can have, you have the most significant bit. A is, A1 is greater than B1. It doesn't matter what's below. Then you're, already, then you're already done. But if they're the same, then you just go to the next one. And if they're, then you compare, then you go to the next one, and so on. So what you can do is you can say, if I'm building an 8-bit comparator, a little one bit comparator that compares my most significant bit. And then, all right, well, then I can build a two bit comparator based on this truth table that I presented, right? You can actually use the logic based on the truth table like we've done in the DHDL before, and then it'll synthesize for, for you. From there, okay, well, I have two bits. Now I can build another two bit comparator, which will do the same logic and tell me which one's the most significant bit. And by, by doing this, uh, these carry signals that I was showing you uh, just before, the result is if this one has the most significant bit and it's going to carry along and carry along, it's going to override everything else. If, if that's the case, it will automatically say, hey, that one's already bigger. It doesn't matter what this calculates, right? So from there, then you're going to have a one bit result. Well, if you do a you're going to have three one-bit results. You're going to have A greater than B, A is equal to B, and A is less than B. Now, why do you think having those specific three, actually I'm becoming a professor in shop all over my coat. Um, why do you think having those three outputs on a comparator, the three one-bit flags, why do you think that those would be useful, going back to the concept of uh, coding fundamentals. Any ideas? Where do you use these comparisons in code? In conditions. In conditions, right? So if I have, if A is greater than B, do what's in the code, <coughs> else don't do what's in the code. <coughs> so at the hardware level, we're going to do, this is going to be building up for something called branch instructions, where you'll say, uh, let's say we have A, if A is greater than B, do the code. Now, branching means that you're going to jump past the, you're going to branch past the instruction if the condition is not met. 
So again, if maintain is actually easier to demonstrate. So if you run the code through and it's you're gonna be branch not equal. BME. Branch not equal. What this means is that if you compare these and they're not equal, you're gonna to branch to the address in memory that represents the instruction past the if state. I'm, I'm going a little past the scope of this section. We're gonna to get to this in section five and section six. But what this this is I'm giving you a flow of like how this is gonna be implemented further on when we get to our advanced digital systems data path. So this is why these are important, being able to do that. You can use this as flags to be able to branch past instructions that you don't want to calculate. So now I've got these VHDL problems that are listed. These are not the TGOs, but this one is. So now we're going to start talking about the 32-bit ALU and MIPS. So when we start getting to uh, the full data path, you're going to need to know how the ALU is used to calculate their load addresses, store addresses, or addition subtraction. The ALU has two 32-bit inputs and has a zero flag, your 32-bit result, overflow and carry out, and a four-bit ALU op signal coming in. Now, how do you think, what do you think the zero bit is? And I've given you a hint here, used for comparison of branch equivalent, branch not equivalent. If I have a flag when the zero bit is equal to one, what do you think that means? When the zero flag here is a, it's a one bit signal, when it's equal to one, what do you think that means coming from the ALU? Uh, less overflow or carry out? No, this is over, we have overflow and carry out oh. signals. Oh, I have a specific additional signal called zero. So if zero is equal to one, meaning true, what do you think that means? Less than one. What's that? Less than one. No, but it's a good guess, but it's not correct. But you're on the right track. If the zero, if the output is zero, bingo. If your result is all zeros, then you're gonna have a flag here that says it's, it's zero. And the reason why is because we're going to be using that flag to perform branch operations. If it, if it meets the condition, it sets the zero bit to one, and then it ends it with what's known as the branch signal. So let's say you, there's going to be conditions where you might generate a branch signal. There's a potential, like here, this quote that we have, if A is equal equals B. Double equals means comparison. For those of you who haven't done Java and C plus plus or C. So we don't know when we're running it what these values are going to be. They could be this could be 10 and 5, this could be 6 and 6. We don't know. So we're going to get to a condition where this is a branch instruction, so it's going to send out a branch control signal. But we only want it to branch past the code inside if the condition is met. So it's going to generate a branch control signal, and if the zero flag is not generated, it will execute the code inside the branch, in, I mean, inside the if statement. If the condition is met, then the flag will be set, and then that will be anded on a simple two-bit AND gate with the branch signal, and we'll say, in that case, yes, you can branch. Don't do this code. Go to the address indicated in the, in the instruction. So that's why this flag is important. So MIPS calculates this particular ALU op in two ways. So what happens is it's going to get a four bit input from what's known as the ALU controller. So the ALU controller receives information from the instruction and in the next TGO I'm going to describe how it's done. But for now, I just have an ALU controller 
that sends a 4-bit signal to the ALU telling me what to do. So when the 4-bit signal is 0, 0, 0, 0, I'm getting A and B. It's determined if the result of A and B. If it's 1, it's going to be A or B. So if I had, so now let's do some advanced digital design. Let's just deal with these two for a moment. So I have a 32-bit result, and I have a 4-bit controller, I have a 4-bit control signals, and I'm trying to choose between A and B or the result of A or B. How do you think I would do that? I have a 4-bit select signal and two 32-bit outputs that I'm trying to choose between. I'll give you a hint. In your VHDL assignment, you've actually designed all of <coughs> the pieces to do it. So now you're just putting pieces together. Any ideas? Oh, there you go. A multiplexer, right? You're going you're gonna to design, if I have four select signals, how big is the right multiplexer going to be? Which multiplexer did you design that had four select signals? 32 to 1. 32 to 1. Well, how, what's, what's the uh, power of 32? 2 to the 5. 2 to the 5. So you need 5 signals, right? So what's 4 signals? 16 to 1 mux. So you're going to use a 16 to 1 mux to multiply each bit. So you're going to have, in the MIPS data path, you'd have 32 16 to 1 muxes. In the data path you're going to design, you're going to have 8. Does that make sense? And I will just tell you what the control signals will be when we get to the final project. But in the meantime, so I have my 16 volt multiplexers. I have 32 bits. Now, right now in this TGO, we only have six values at the moment. I'm aware of that. That's fine. We're going to be building the ALU more. But these are important because this is what we've covered so far in the class in terms of what you guys have designed and what you actually understand. What did you say that was? Called. Which one? 3.16. These are actual operations. So these are the 32-bit values on the input, A and B. And this, if I get here, this ALU op signal, what's happening? Remember, uh, yeah, I, yeah, I'm going to give you a brief. No, no, this is actually we already covered it. So if you recall, in the ALU, multifunction ALU here, just remember this from last class. You're actually calculating all of these values, right? And then you're going to use a multiplexer to select between them. So here, I'm showing you how it's done in, in the MIPS data path. And what's being done is you have, an, you have a calculation of an AND bit, of an AND signal. You have a calculation of an OR bit. So what's happening is... You have a 16-bit MUX. If it's 0, 0, 0, 0, it selects A and B. So you're actually doing all of these calculations in your data path, and then the multiplexer is selecting between them. So the third one is 0, 0, 1, 0 is A plus B. And the fourth one is 0, 1, 0, well, I'm sorry, 0, 1, 1, 0 is A minus B. Now, what's the difference between these two signals? Right? But just the, yeah, you're on the right path. But what's the difference between just these two values? Mm -hmm. And how do we, from last class, how do we differentiate between addition and subtraction and the add sub? Mm -hmm. You have that one bit, add, add sub signal, right? So if, I, if you were designing this data path, you're designing an 8 bit data path, and you've got two control signals. One for addition, one subtraction, where the bit difference is one. What would you do to ensure that this matched your? So I have an input, and I've I've determined that one of these bits matches exactly to what I want to put into my add subtract. What do you want to do? Connect it, right? I'm going to connect it because remember, zero is addition for the add sub, one is subtract. If I have the control signal where zero and one is already here, 
Just tie that bit to add sub, and it'll do it for you automatically. Does that make sense? And then here we have if ALU control signal is 0, 1, 1, 1, then ALU out is going to be A less than B. Now, I'm going to explain what this notation means. Now, this means that if A is less than B, your result is going to be 1. Otherwise, your result is going to be 0. So you would do the comparison. Then not only would you get a result of saying of the zero flag being set if A is not less than B, but the result is actually going to be zero. Because we don't actually pair at this point. Because what's going to happen is you're going to have flag and you're going to have branch instruction. Now what we're going to be learning about later is sometimes if you you want to do multiple levels of instructions. Let's say you have loops within loops. You can store this value of 1 in there to actually reduce the amount of code required to implement the nested loop. Say, so, oh, this comparison set, then all I have to do is do this, and then you execute the code or don't execute the code. But we're going to be going over, over that in uh, the subsequent sections. But this is what this notation means. That A layout is equal to A less than B, such that if it's true, it'll put a 1 out on the result, or if it's false, it'll put a 0 out on the result. And last but certainly not least, we have an actual control signal for NOR. And I actually had the answer to my add subtract thing right here. You can use the bit that for negating the B input to the adder. So does the code for nor have anything to do with the fact that it's not A and not B? It's well this is what do you mean like not A and not B? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you could so you could do uh as so the question is it's one one zero zero and you have zero 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 for and. Right. So I was wondering if that has anything to do with the fact that so we could actually do this to what you're saying is there could be a design methodology where um, and I know the answer to your question but I'm, I'm reiterating it in a different way just to make sure I understand um, would you use these two bits as a way to like perform the two's complement on the on the uh, a and b in order to get not a and not b and then do a nor well I guess two's complement is not the same as right but you're doing I'm saying not a and not b um, well, the, ans the answer to your question is that's not how it's done in the actual MIPS data path. Um, just because since it's a compiler-driven encoding of the microengine, you're going to have the values put in. And so it's going to have an actual not infrastructure. However, if on your project you felt that was a better implementation, you're more than welcome to do it. So the answer is it's not how it's done, but feel free to try. So, does anybody have any other questions on the control signals before we move on? Okay, so now here's how these ALU control signal, these magical ALU control signals are generated. What we have um, is we have a what's known as the actual control unit. Erase this. Now we have an instruction, a 32 bit instruction, right? And we determined in MIPS and reduced instruction that computers that are bits. So the first six bits of the instruction are what's known as the opcode. And this is sent to what's known as the controller. If you recall from the first day of the course, I discussed how digital systems are often a combination of a control unit and a data path, right? So what happens is the controller is going to send out this two-bit signal called ALU operation, or ALU op for short. That's two bits. And it's going to go all the way to the ALU control unit, 
which generated our 4-bit signal that we were just talking about. So this is the 4-bit output, which contributes to TGO 3.16. Now, this isn't the only input that is receiving. It's also receiving called something called a function, which is a 6-bit value, which is at the end of every what's known as R-type instruction. R-type instructions are known as register instructions. And the reason why is that you're performing an operation on two results from the local registers, the faster ones, doing something in the ALU, and then storing it back in, the, in another register, register instruction. So you have the function, F-U-N, which is often abbreviated as F-U-N-C-T, punct. That's the last six bits, right? So these six bits are also sent to the ALU control. And from there, you have these six bits plus the other two bits, which we're going to be going over later in the course about what those values are. But from here, if these function, those two bits are important. I'm trying to make sure I don't throw too much of you, too much at once I don't want to confuse you. But not every, here's the thing, not every instruction has a function. For example, an I type, an immediate instruction, you guys remember what an immediate value is? You're adding, like, it's C equals A plus 5, you have some sort of constant in the instruction. So you need the last 16 bits of that instruction to do this. So therefore, it doesn't have a function. So it relies entirely on ALU up. I have not covered any immediate instructions at the moment. Now what happens is if you have a function value, it will automatically choose this. And the reason we know this is because the ALU op will be 0, 0 if it's an R-type instruction. Now here's the thing. 0, 0 for R-type instructions, add is an R-type instruction, and so is subtract. So just from the ALU op code, it's difficult to tell. So you need this six-bit function value. In fact, for add and subtract, the op code for both of them is six zeros. But the function for add is 20x, and the function for subtract is 22x. So going in here, it's going to go in and based on these, select a control signal, which is then sent to the ALU operation. We're starting to go a little, little further down the rabbit hole, so to speak. So that's where these, all of these values that you're throwing in the uh, <coughs> control unit come from. So here, add and subtract, two hex, this is, when I say 20 hex, do you, how many people, and this is not meant to shame anybody, I'm just curious, do not know how to convert from binary to hex? Okay, so I'll explain then. So it's been a long time. Um, uh, so hex is, you take the 4-bit value here, and it, all 4-bit values within a binary number, and convert that, and that's the hex signal. So for here, this is a good example. So here, this is 1010. Zero, zero. So this is 10, right? But you only want it to, rep you can only represent one digit in every, you know, say, for example, you can't go to, you can't represent 11 in decimal without a second value, right? Because it can go from 0 to 9. In hex, it can go from 0 to 15, but since we're only representing it in one decimal, then 10 becomes A. 11 becomes B, 12 becomes C, all the way up to 15, which is F. So here it's 10, so this is going to be A, and this is 1, 0, so that's 2, correct? So in hex, that's 2A. Now, unfortunately, since we do actually have internet, oh, that might be, we might actually have internet. On Blackboard, I have posted the MIP screen sheet. Come on, come through. Yes. Courses. And this is now you're getting some insight into how I 
torture you guys. Okay, so in, under content, I have all these reference files here. And in one of these reference files is what's known as the MIP screen sheet. Okay, so these are all of the instructions that are implemented in the full MIPS implementation. You're not gonna, your data path isn't gonna do all this. You're gonna do a reduced version. The re reason why I had that uh, thing from, uh, from uh, Thomas Hobbs at the beginning about how everything can be done with addition and subtraction is so you don't have to worry about you know, implementing multiplication in the data path. I'll teach you guys about the IEEE 754, but I'm not gonna expect you to be able to do all these floating point arithmetic operations. But we are gonna do the basic discussion of what's going on here. These are the instruction formats I was talking about earlier. So these most significant, do I, can I zoom in here? Yeah, it's on exam three, you're definitely gonna be asked to reproduce this. Um, the most signific significant bits are the opcode, which I was just discussing, that's sent to the control unit, which generates a two-bit ALU control signal, which is then combined with these six these significant bits to generate what we're discussing in the topical guide objective. I actually changed that to eight bits. Okay. Um, but here's the thing, immediate requires 15 bits. The immediate value is a constant. Now, here's something interesting. The immediate value, this is where the knowing the fact that it's a compiler-driven encoding of the microengine comes into play. The immediate value, when driven by the compiler, if it's a negative number, like if it's A minus five, it'll put negative five in here and allow you to do what's an add immediate instruction with a two's complement number. So if we look here, we have add immediate, but if we scroll down, we don't have a subtract immediate instruction, right? So the compiler, by driving the value in the immediate, allows us to reduce the area overhead in the control unit. So that's using how using the compiler uh, uh, property reduces area. But here's the, what I wanted to show you, and this is the important part. So opcode function in hex. The opcode for add is zero. And as I mentioned before, the opcode for subtract is zero, right? Your function value, which is what we're sending to the ALU control unit, is how we differentiate between them. So in this case, I'm gonna zoom just a little more. Here we go. 20 hex, right? That's one zero and then four zeros. We go back here, add. One zero and then four zeros, right? So this is how it all ties into play. Subtract is 20, we can actually, so this is 20, two hex for the most, the two most significant bits, right? And this is two again, right? So this becomes 22, and you, typically you'll have an H afterwards <coughs> indicating hex. And if we go to our MIP screen sheet, zero and 22 hex. So that's how we differentiate between these two. So hopefully I have not thrown too much at you, but this is where hopefully you're starting to see how all of this ties together. So this becomes, sorry, one zero zero one one zero, which we were to calculate the hex is actually two and six, two six hex, then it's and. And if you go through the MIPS data sheet, you'll notice that these will match. So you have two five hex is for or, two zero is and, two two is subtract, two a is set less than, which we discussed earlier, and then this is two seven, which is nor. So that's how what we have here corresponds to what's on the MIP screen sheet. So I have changed this, this problem. Uh, this, is, <laughs> this is where your assignment that's due in two weeks will end because this is the last uh, VHDL assignment in chapter three problem. 
So at this point, in order to implement uh, the 8-bit adder subtractor, you're going to, the previous problem, you have done an 8-bit adder subtractor. You have done, you'll design 8-bit and or nor. But here's the thing. I want you to be, uh, remain consistent, too. So you have 8 bits. You have 8 bits. Still use 16 to 1 multiplexers and still use these signals because we're going to be adding more to the ALU later. So this allows us to have an ALU that does 16 functions. So right now you have, or, you have put in 6. And also you're going to generate output flags. So if it's So you can say in your path, in your design, you can say if a, if, if, if result is equal to zero, then zero equals one, else equals zero. So do we not finish, or are we not going to finish VHDL2? Oh, no, you are. No. You, you'll need everything you'll need, but I'm giving you, I've given you two weeks heads up. So everything, but I've taken, I took four problems out from the, from uh, 2.13 on. So originally I think it was 24, but I think it's 19 or 20 now. Because those problems were, okay, take your 8-bit and turn it to 32-bit. Take your 8-bit, turn it to 32-bit, and those are gone. So the rest of, so do... Um, I believe I have it listed on uh, November, what was the date? It's whatever, 5th. November 5th. October, you were. November <laughs> 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 uh, No, you do, you're not going to want that. Um, do on October 5th, VHDL, remainder of uh, Chapter 2, and... All of Chapter Three, which is only set, which is seven problems. Now, the key thing is, by this point, once you've done this ALU, you will have accomplished one of the course objectives. The design takes something from the SSI and create a VLSI circuit. So, by doing this, you will have achieved one of the course objectives already. Okay, so from here, we're going to start talking about floating point addition, and then we're going to, for the rest of chapter three, we're going to talk about um, a sign multiplication algorithm, and then we're going to discuss two division algorithms. So floating point addition is how do you take the IEEE 754 format and perform arithmetic? You're not going to be expected to reproduce this in VHDL, so if I don't expect you to do it in VHDL, that means I'm going to expect you to do it on an exam. So, but here's the thing. I'm going to limit the complexity of the problems I can ask on the exam because of time. Now, floating point, as we kind of discussed earlier, we've discussed this IEEE 754 format. It's the same thing as performing, let's say I wanted to add 9.9999 times 10 to the 1 plus 1 1.610 times 10 to the negative 1. Or 10, or 10 to the, yeah, so we have 10 to the 1 and then 10 to the negative 1 here. So in order to do that, you have to make the power of 10 the same, right, in order to add the decimals. So 1.610 times 10 to the negative 1 becomes 0 0.016 times 10 to the negative 1, 10 to the 1, and then you add them together, right? So now the last part is you have to normalize it to scientific notation. And then it becomes one point, and you can call this one five times ten to the negative two. Or since we maintain three bits, it becomes one point zero zero two times ten to the two. So the question becomes, how do we do that in binary? So we already have the format that we remember the format that we discussed before. What what is that format? IEEE 754, correct. So what are the three parts of IEEE 754 32-bit format? There are three parts. What are those values? Zero, one, two, and three. And what's the sign? Yeah, what's the first bit? What's the exponent? 
How many bits are in the next bit? Yeah, next eight bits. And then one of the next three, 23 bits. And this, right? And so you can kind of see, and what was the equation that we used to calculate, to translate the, that formula into decimal? Lots of, uh. <laughs> Here, I'm, I'm Professor Robot, and you guys are going to tell me what the equation is. Since you guys all just turned in a homework assignment where you had to write it, I assume one of you remembers. Uh, negative one. Negative one. To the end. What is n? You're on the right path. Though. It is s. Yeah. Yep. Times one plus one plus one plus one. Times e. Times two. Bingo. See, you guys know it. So there you go. That's how we convert. So now we're just trying to represent this in notation by using this formula and the actual binary representation. Now, on an exam, for example, in this question, I'm saying calculate the sum of. 0 0.5625 and negative 3.75. You will be expected to convert these two numbers into their binary representations. But here's the thing. Remember that uh, kind of guide I gave you last class? Maybe you don't because you've had an exam in between of how to convert these numbers. What were you? And I said that I would only ask you up to values that can be represented in four bits of decimal. So what were those two? What was, what was that guide I gave you? Two, two to the minus one is equal to what? Zero point five. Then two to the negative three. Zero point two five. Two to the negative three. Zero point one two five. Two to the negative four. Two to the point zero six two five. Okay, I will reread this for the video. Two to the negative one is point five. Two to the negative two is zero point two five. 2 to the negative 3 is 0 0.125, and 2 to the negative 4 is 0 0.0625. How many of you last time? Okay. Um, so, I, I know the answers are written up here, but focus on the board. What is 0 0.5625 for binary? Negative 1, negative 4, so 1, 0, 0, 1. Correct. What about 0.375? Why is it zero one one zero? Because if the the two is about minus thirty two, it's still minus three. Mm -hmm. So the way to do it, if you get some weird number, like if I put here, I'm so fucked. Zero point eight seven five. Here's one that's not on the on the screen. So the way you do it is point eight seven five greater than. Yes. So now you subtract and it becomes zero point three seven five, right? Is 0.375 greater than 0.25? Yeah. So you can subtract that, and it becomes 0 0.125. <coughs> is this greater than or equal to? Yes. yes. If you subtract it, what does it become? What does it become? So since it's, is it greater than? Zero. Then it becomes, so now 0 0.875 is 0 0.1110. So that's how you do it. So when I ask you a question on the exam, the numbers that are represented there will not go past four bits. If it goes past four bits, if you're trying to calculate it, stop, erase what you've run, and try a different way because you, what you have is incorrect. So here I've taken the liberty of doing this for you. 0 0.1001. And this in the notation becomes 1.0010 times 2 to the negative 1. And why did I normalize that? One plus, exactly right, because it's one plus. So again, 0 0.0375 becomes 0 0.0110, which we normalize to 1.1000 times 2 to the negative 2. So we're doing the same thing. We're going to change them so the exponent is the same, right? 
So now it's changing both to 2 and the negative 1. But here's the thing. I also asked for negative 0 0.375. So now this becomes the 2's complement is 1 point. If you recall from 2's complement, this is 1.0011. But then you have to add one bit. So this becomes 1010. So that's how that, that is, occurs. And so if we were doing IEEE 754 format, it would look like this. 23 bits is the mantissa. And same thing here, 23 bits. Now, here's the key thing. This is an important point because this is how you're going to deal with overflow in these problems. The difference in how you deal with overflow is when you're comparing the sign bits in the floating point addition. So when you add these together, you're getting 1.0010, which is this one, and you're getting 1.01, which is this one, right? So now you're very, very going to get overflow, this red bit here. Let me scroll up a little bit so people in the back can see. So you're going to get the, see this red bit here? You get this overflow. Now, if the bits are the same, remember earlier when I was in the typical guide objective, I said when the, bit, when the bits are the same, you can't get overflow? Because if, I'm sorry, if the bits are the same, yeah, it's going to be sub addition and subtraction of similar, so same signs. So what's going to happen is this bit here, this one zero in the floating point ALU, will check to see if they're the same. If they're not the same, that means you're performing some sort of subtraction, right? So then this just becomes part of the sign extension, and then the result is this. 0 0.0110, which since we had up here is 2 to the negative 1, this becomes 0 0.011. I can, I can actually times 2 to the negative 1, uh, 2 to the 1, times 2 to the negative 1, and the result is times 2 to the negative 1. There we go. Now, the result is this. Where you have 2 to the negative 2, is it supposed to be negative 1? Yes. So, 2 to the negative 1, right? So two, 0 0.0110 is the same as 0 0.0011 times 2 to the negative 0. So the reason I did that is because I wanted to talk, let's calculate this out. 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, right? So if I have 0, 0, 1, 1, what's, this, what's it in decimal? So we, we're doing this backwards. Now we're going the other way. Is this point, is the point 0.5 here? Is the point 0.25 here? Is the 0 0.125 here? Yes? So you have 1.25 and then 0 0.0625. 0 0 so this becomes... 0.1875. So now, if we were to check, if we have, uh, was it five six? Uh, what is that? What are the two numbers in the problem? If you actually go through and check, 0 0.5625 and 0.375. If you were to do the math this way, borrow four one. Eight two five. Oops, sorry. Oh, sorry. Five, five, six, two five. So that becomes fifteen. That's where eight comes from. Twelve minus five is seven and five. So put point one eight seven five. So our answers match. So I have included. This isn't part of the example question, but I include what happens if I were to do minus 0.5625 plus 0 0.375. In this case, we're doing the same thing, but we'd get a negative number, right? We'd get negative 0.875. So this is, I've added this because this has caused confusion in the past, so hopefully this clarifies everything. So again, we do the two's complement of 0.5625 this time. Let me scroll up. 
for the class, which becomes 0 0.0110. Adding one becomes, oh yeah, so this is going to point zero. 0 0.1110, which becomes times 2 to the negative 1, which equals 1.11 times 2 to the negative 2. Since our value of 0.375 is already 2 to the negative 2, we can then add these together. Right? And now, this bit carries over, right? But here's the thing. You see this value here of 1? If we do this, it's 1.100. And the most significant bit is 1. That means we're going to have a negative number. Therefore, we do the two's complement, which becomes 0.11 times 2 to the negative 2, which is 1.1 times 2 to the negative 3, which is equivalent of the value here that we found, right? So if we did, this is 0 0.0110 times 2 to the negative 1, move the decimal point over 2, that becomes 2 to the negative 3. So if we take the two's complement of this answer here, by doing this comparison, we actually get the number we were expecting. So this is a way of checking our result. So you see that if you do this where the signs are different and you use this as a result, if the bit, most significant bit is 1, that means it's negative. Therefore, you can just take the 2's complement and check your answer. Let me scroll up a little bit. Does that make sense? So it's comparing in this previous one. The bits are different. As comparing the most significant bit that's not overflow, it's zero. That means you get a positive result. You get overflow, and the most significant bit is a one, and the sign bits are different, like we have here, then it's a negative number. So that's how you ensure that you get the correct answer in this result. So for the second example, okay, so the last thing um, I wanted to note is that in the answer to the question, I always say, and represent the result in IEEE 754 format. So I'm going to expect you to say the result. So remember this example here, 3.5? I actually have the result here. Now, the way I did this is we have 2 to the negative 3 here. So this is 1.10. I've normalized it to make sure the 1 is the most significant bit, so we maintain the consistent with the, with the mantissa. Now, this negative 3, what does that mean in respect to our equation? This value is equal to e minus 127, right? Which means... One, well, if 130, what's 130 minus 127? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So what's the so what's the answer? Now that you know. No. No, no, no. That's that's oh, the, from the man test. This is just okay. this is number two to the e minus 127, oh, okay. right? Is the is the part of the equation? So the result that you have here is the result of e minus 127. So in order to get negative three, so it's, you're going to be negative three is equal to e minus 127. So what is e going to be? 124, correct. Therefore, e is equal to 124. So that's what's going to be in your IEEE 754 representation. And so here's the easy way to do this, because you're going to get something that's very similar. It's going to be 124 through 127, because I'm going to keep it like this. So 127, since it's 8 bits, the value of 127 is 5, 6, 7, 0 followed by 7 ones, correct? So from here, you're just going to subtract the values. So if this is 127, what do you think 124 is going to be? 
Yeah, take off three, exactly right. So it just becomes zero, zero, right? So if I had, if I, if it was 130, what would I do here? Right, so now it becomes 128 is this, right? So how do I change this to 130? Bingo, right? Because 130 is 128 plus 2, right? So you just add 2. So you're going to have some sort of simple calculation where you demonstrate that you understand 127 and 128 in binary. And then the last thing is, since the mantissa is 23 bits, I do not expect you to write all 23 bits. That would be obnoxious, even zero, 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 zero. But I do need you to demonstrate that you know it is 23 bits. So this is a, because your answer is going to have a four bit, some sort of four bit representation. And so if you just write on the exam on that problem that the mantissa is 23 bits, that is sufficient to demonstrate knowledge. And the same thing I've showed you how to do this here. In this case, it's one, minus 2, so this becomes 125. So we only subtracted 2 from there. 127 minus 2 is 125. So here, we can go through a quick example of when you're just adding two positive numbers. 0 0.8125 is 0.1101, which becomes 1.1010. I'm sorry, the, the sum of 0 0.1825 and 0.25 in binary. So we're going to get some sort of overflow past the original four bits because this the value is actually going to be 1.0625, which is right here. So what happens is the sign bits are the same because they're both zero. So what's going to happen is you're going to create the binary values. You normalize it to match. So this is 2 to the negative 1. This becomes 2 to the negative 1 as well. You want the larger number to have the most significant bit, obviously. So you add these together, and you're going to get this overflow bit again, like we had before. The difference is, because the signs are the same, it becomes part of the solution. Therefore, you just normalize this. So it becomes 1.0001 times 2 to the negative 0, which is binary of 1.0625. And then putting it in IEEE format, your 0 is equal to E minus 127. So what's E? One twenty seven. Therefore, one twenty seven. And then you take these four bits and put it here and say that the mantis is twenty three bits and then the sign bit is zero. So uh, what was the uh, the uh, carry out? The reason why this is a good as I want to emphasize this since the sign bits are the same. So if we were doing the IEEE format for these, right? It would be zero for the sign bit, right? And since it's going to be 1.1010 times 2 to the negative 1, right? So it's going to be negative 1, so it's going to be 126. So it's going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 0, since we're subtracting 1, right? So there should be one other one there. And then you're taking these bits here, and this becomes 1010. Zero, zero. Now the sign bit for this value here is also 0, right? So once, as part of the floating point architecture, it's actually going to compare these bits. And so by normalizing it to the same power, that's how we do the addition there. Okay. Well, this is actually a really good place to stop because multiplication and division is going to take a full lecture. So we're going to be doing, for homework, 15, 16, 17, for the TGOs, and for the example questions, you're going to be doing, did we cover any other here? No. Uh, so there would be just 5 and 6.
Does anybody have any questions on uh, what we cover today before I dismiss you? Then you are dismissed.